Welcome to Conservation Conversation with me, Kaz. Canned line hunting sadly remains legal in South Africa. Many conservationist groups and individuals have long lobbied with the South African government against canned line hunting. We learn more from Chris Mercer, who is recognized as the leading international expert on the practice of canned lion hunting and has lobbied against it for more than 20 years. A little bit about Chris. Chris and his late partner Bev established a wildlife rehab center and sanctuary in the Karoo region of South Africa. When they heard of the unimaginable cruel treatment of lions on South Africa's lion farms, Chris started to campaign against canned lion hunting. The campaign against canned hunting was born. Welcome, Mr. Chris Mercer. Thank you for taking time to chat with Ultimate Safari about a very contentious topic, and that is canned lion hunting. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Chris, can you start off for us, please, by explaining exactly what canned lion hunting is? The difference between any other form of trophy hunting and uh, canned hunting is where the target animal is unfairly prevented from escaping the hunter, uh, either by physical constraints such as fencing uh, or by mental constraints such as being bottle-fed and hand-reared and tame. Uh, but it's much more than that. That just describes the event. Yes. It's actually an industry. Yes. It's a whole process whereby lions are bred like battery hens for the bullet. Yes. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to understand that that's what it is. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it's faux hunting um, or fake hunting, if you like. Yes. Um, and, and the um, hunting operators go to great lengths to uh, try to hide the fact that, <laughs> that the lion is, uh, is tame. Yes. Um, or um, more recently, in order to counter the pressure of public opinion, uh, the hunting industry, which of course is obscenely wealthy yes. um, and um, able to employ the smartest public re relations brains in the world yes. um, to make their uh, hideous uh, activity sound like conservation. Yes. And they've come up with something that they call ranched lions, okay. which is like halfway between tame and wild, whereby the animals are fed, uh, but the, they're, not, they're not raised in small pens yes. uh, in unsanitary conditions. Yes. And they reckon that that's, that's okay. But of course, you've got the whole ambit. I mean, there must be more than 300 uh, lion farms um, in South Africa, all breeding animals uh, for the bullet. Yeah. So, of course, like any other industry, you've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. um, and really, ranch lions uh, are a half measure. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I get that. It's actually, um, it's almost like trying to sanitize what is an abhorrent practice, right? Uh, exactly. Okay. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, heartbreaking as it is. I actually, um, in, in doing research to try and understand the sides of, of uh, canned lion hunting, I came across um, a good governance report um, by, I think it's Good Governance Africa report, who, who announced that um, hunting as a whole in South Africa in terms of tourism is valued at about 341 million US dollars. Um, and that for sure the funds being purported to go towards conservation, these claims are actually met with very little evidence. So um, 
again, I think that the numbers behind the 300 odd farms that you've just mentioned kind of reiterates the dark and, and dastardliness of this whole story. Recently, uh, well, recently, uh, two or three years ago, you'll recall that the Portfolio Committee for the Environment of the South African Parliament uh, held an open meeting, if you like. Uh, they called it a colloquium, but yes. um, I think that's a pretentious term to describe what was basically a workshop. Um, and they wanted public input on whether uh, lion farming and its spin-off, the uh, canned lion hunting, should be permitted. Yes. Now, what we did in order to meet that opportunity, we prepared a 60-page booklet, if you like, in which we listed uh, and referenced all the bad publicity that South Africa had received mm. that we could find. Yes. And we found 60 pages of um, films, documentaries, newspaper reports, um, lamestream media, uh, social media, 60 pages of bad publicity. Yes. And I, I got that 60 pages uh, printed into a booklet and we handed a copy to each of the members of the portfolio committee. Yes. And the message we gave them with it was, look at this. You've got a department of tourism doing its best to market South Africa overseas. And here you've got one industry which is actually sabotaging the efforts of the uh, tourism department. Yes. And uh, if you read the report um, of the uh, chairman yes. uh, of, of that committee, when they issued the report, they actually uh, uh, gratifyingly put a great deal of stress on that research of ours to say, that this industry is causing more harm than good and it should be abolished. Yes, yes. Uh, of course, that's just the, the, the not even the start of the process. That's that's a pre-start yeah. of the whole process of uh, bringing the industry to an end. Uh, you've only got to read the history of the abolition of slavery uh, to understand how complex it is to get government to deconstruct a yeah. whole industry which it has promoted and permitted. Yes. Now, what's going to happen, of course, is the moment any concrete steps are taken uh, to bring this uh, industry to an end. And uh, by that, I'm referring uh, to the reality that the uh, existing lions in, in that industry are doomed. There's yes. nothing we can do for them yes. because government will never be allowed to just ban the industry outright yeah. uh, and provide sanctuary for the surviving lions. What they will do, uh, and they've already indicated their thinking, is that they will allow the industry to phase itself out over the um, uh, breeding period. Say it takes three years or four years um, for a, a, a cub to reach huntable size. Yes. They will probably give the industry five to seven years within which to uh, bring their activities to an end. And if they don't, and even if they do, you're going to get litigation. The same wealthy industry that provides spin yes. um, is able to provide litigation on a massive scale. Yes. Um, uh, we in South Africa, of course, are very familiar with the uh, so-called Stalingrad defense in which the legal process is basically abused. It is just strung out so that the years go by until in the end, no one knows or cares what it was all about in the first place. Yes. And I foresee that happening here. Yes. Well, we've we've actually it's it's happened already. I think, um, um, and I'm referencing here to the broadcasting of the ITV Cook report, which exposed the the lion hunting industry. And I think it was the um, I'm just 
checking my notes here, um, they actually did bring about legislation that banded the practice, um, saying that captive bred lions must be able to fend for themselves for 24 months before being hunted. But then I read that the South African Breeding Association in 2010 won a high court appeal, <laughs> which basically then just legalize the practice all over again. And I mean, this is as early as 2010. So the industry has definitely grown significantly um, since then, because I think it's my understanding that today on these 300 odd farms, there's between eight and 12,000 lions that are kept for the bullet, as you've put it. Uh, yes, and uh, statistics show that something like a thousand lions are uh, hunted uh, every year. Um, uh, probably the figure is a lot higher than that. Yes, yes. But uh, if I can just give you a little more perspective on the incident you're talking about. Yes. Martinus van Skalkweg, when he was Minister for the Environment, uh, made some effort. It was, there was no legislation, actually. Yes. It didn't okay. reach that stage. Okay. But what they did, I think, was to uh, place conditions in permits, which I suppose amounts to much the same thing, yeah. to the effect that lions had to be kept for a certain, uh, released for a certain period before they could be hunted. Yes. Um, uh, of, of course, that again was political spin because um, it, to my mind, it struck me uh, as saying, well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we, we'll We'll pretend that uh, the lion has become wild in yeah. three weeks or a month or whatever, yeah. so that I, as minister, can pretend that I've banned canned hunting. Th then I'll come back to that. Uh, because it's quite interesting. Yes. Um, I got a call from the uh, state attorney uh, to say that the Lion Farmers Association were taking the minister on review uh, on the ground that his uh, decision was uh, irrational and therefore unlawful. And I actually gave an affidavit to the state attorney um, uh, on behalf of the minister in that case. Yes. Um, and then... Um, Van Skalkvik lost that uh, in the high court, or he won in the high court and lost on appeal. I yeah. can't remember. It's years ago. Yeah. But then we got Edna Malewa. So now we've got one minister of the environment coming up with a, a, a trick, a device, in order to claim that he's banned can lion hunting. Next, we get Edna Malewa appointed minister for the environment, mm. and she tried another little trick. Her trick was to play with definitions. Oh, she said, uh, we don't want to know how you uh, define canned hunting. I'm defining it as any hunt that does not conform to the uh, permit conditions, whatever those conditions have been um, imposed for that particular hunt. Yeah. If they don't uh, if, they, if they violate any of those conditions, then she says it's a canned hunt. And of course, that misses the point completely. It's yeah. the whole idea of uh, factory farming lions, which uh, disgusts the public. And of course, we were compelled to uh, point that out. Yeah. And now, of course, we've got Minister Creasy saying that she's making a determined attempt to stamp it out. And uh, I... I uh, <laughs> I would like to believe it, but I've seen it and heard it all before. And knowing how hard the industry is going to fight and how much money they will throw at it, I, I don't know. Um, South Africa's got so many other problems. And conservation has always been a Cinderella department in the ANC government. No, for sure. It's like a nice to have little flower thing on the side, as you say. You know, if 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 we if it's going to benefit us going forward in another sector, then yes, we'll throw a little bit of money at it. But otherwise, it's it's certainly not high on their their list of priorities with everything else that they have to deal with. 
Well, well, of course, you see that in the uh, terms of the new draft white paper. Yes. I mean, you can be forgiven for thinking that this has very little to do with conservation and a great deal to do with politics. Yes. Because on every page you get uh, phrases like poverty alleviation, yes. um, demographics, uh, yes. the industry must represent demographics, yes. there must be transformation, yes. um, uh, there, there must be youth involvement, yeah. uh, the industry must have an equal number of of uh, females to males, yes. um, that's politics. It's got nothing whatever to do with conservation. Yes. But I imagine, to be fair to Barbara Creasy's department, I imagine that knowing that they're a Cinderella department, they have to try and package their ban on canned lion hunting in uh, some politically um, suitable way that will persuade the cabinet to agree yes. to it. That, yes, yes. And I, that makes absolute sense. And I think if you, if you're going to be boxing with big gloves, you in a, in a, oh, sorry, with small gloves and a big rink, mm -hmm. you need to, <laughs> you need to yeah. adjust your strategy just a little bit, but it's interesting the, 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 some mm -hmm. of the things that you've brought up there, Chris, because um, I mean, I, I didn't read the whole 563 page report, but um, if you read the executive summary, the words um, conservation and biodiversity are easily six or seven sentences down the introduction of the summary. Mm -hmm. So it's, as you say, it just shows you that good luck to them. And I hope that they can get it right because there's some really nasty little spin-offs that are that are coming from this and one of the things that I wanted to touch with you is in fact um it's not just about the canned lion hunting right Chris there's the other horrific side of this industry is um the lion bone trade can we chat a little bit about the lion bone trade well, the expert on that, of course, is Richard Pierce. Uh, and as you probably know, he has um, recently completed his um, three year research documentary, Lions, Bones, and Bullets. So, um, to get uh, the, the real expert's uh, view on that, you need to have a chat to Richard. Yes. Um, but of course, uh, there are always spin offs in every industry. So the moment you allow lion farming, you're going to get resourceful people exploiting every square inch of a lion carcass. Yes. And, and that's what you've got. Uh, they can sell a, a, a carcass to the middleman. Um, and I can't remember the guy's name uh, or, or, or even pronounce it, but I just know that he's based in Vientiane, which is what, Laos? Laos? Yes. Or Re Republic of Leo, or what, uh, pronounce that how you like. Yes. Um, and then what he does is he fills his warehouse with all these bones, and then he loads them in a truck and drives them across the border into China where they go to a tiger bone wine factory. Yes. Now, because the lion bones are genetically similar to tiger bones, they are actually marketed falsely as tiger bone. And um, they're boiled up with um, uh, for several days yes. with um, uh, all other animal parts, I think turtle, shell, um, oh, I can't remember all of them, uh, and monkey, monkey something or other, monkey parts. Um, so you've got this horrible mix all boiled up. And then, of course, it's made into a form of wine, which is uh, supposed to be a health drink for the Chinese market. Yes. And then it's also compressed into a sort of cake that looks very much like biltong okay. uh, for the Vietnamese market. Okay. But the profits are uh, stupendous. 
Yeah. I mean, something that might sell for a thousand, you know, for a carcass that might sell for a thousand dollars to the South African farmer will, by the time it's been processed and say, sold, uh, probably realize about 60,000 US dollars. Oh, my word. So yeah, it's a it's it's a pretty lucrative um, spin-off that you that you've mentioned there, which is horrific. I mean, as you say, if if the practice is going to continue, then all of these other little spin-off things are, are going to continue as well. And it doesn't it doesn't only affect animals like lions because, you know, indirectly it also starts affecting animals like pangolins um, and turtles and all kinds of other species that really should we should be affording protection to but we're definitely not doing what we need to be doing hey oh yes uh and this is what richard pierce found uh when he was uh sniveling around asia with a hidden camera yeah. uh, all the uh, shops that were selling lion bone products were also selling powdered rhino horn and uh, every other um, endangered species you could possibly think of. Yes. Heartbreaking. Okay, so Chris, just to touch one last time on this um, this white paper, I, th- I think I read as early as uh, a week ago, or maybe, yeah, my apologies, it was probably just a, a month or so ago, that operators are being offered a, a voluntary exit but that the minister is looking for skills in terms of vet care, animal welfare, handling of lions, and then, of course, the obligatory labor and trade unions to um, all be part of the dialogue for the for the closure of, of business. So just to reiterate your point, you think that if this is going to happen, that it's going to be, it's not going to be an overnight process. It's going to take a number of years. Oh, absolutely. Uh, if it ever happens, if it's ever abolished, it's going to take a number of years. I mean, look at look at the problem the abolitionists had for slavery uh, yes. in the United Kingdom. Yes. Uh, they were making great strides in mobilizing public opinion. Yes. Uh, everybody yes. uh, and his dog was against the slave trade. Yes. Uh, but against that, uh, y- you had the vested interests. Yes. And then what happened? War was declared with France and suddenly... Um, with an existential threat to the country, the whole um, idea of um, leaving the Caribbean sugar plantations um, to the French, because that's what happened. If they withdrew, the French would occupy them, uh, was politically impossible and strategically impossible. Um, And uh, that's actually what you've got here with the uh, lion bone trade. You see, it the animal makes too much money for them to to give up without a fight. Right from the moment of birth, you've got cub petting. Yes. Cubs happen to be adorable creatures, and so um, foreign tourists in particular will pay vast sums to visit and cuddle a lion. Volunteers will pay extortionate sums to be able to bottle feed the little uh, lion cubs, thinking that they're doing something for conservation because yes. that's what they're told. Told, oh, yes. Um, uh, and then, of course, in that way, they can um, the lion farmers can defray the cost of raising the lion to huntable size. Yes. And then, of course, they make a, a, a great deal of money, uh, depending on the size of size of the animal and its magnificence and the size of its mane and so on. Um, they make a lot of money on the actual kill. Yes. And and then, of course, there are the bones. Yes. So the animal's body uh, makes a profit for the industry all the way through its life cycle and after it's dead. And beyond, yes. So, I mean, having met and spoken to lion farmers and lion operators, I can tell you now they're absolutely determined. They will not give up without a fight. And I think those lion farmers and lion lion hunters uh, or operators are have significant um, support from overseas as well. 
there's a, an organization called the Safari Club International who are huge hunting lobbyists. I think at the moment they're sitting with over 50,000 members. So they obviously are also going to be fighting a fight and throwing money at, at opposing the ban on lion hunting. What do you think? Safari Club International is the heart of the beast. Yes. Um, it, it, if you look at the membership, it's virtually a who's who of the wealthy of America. Yes. Um, now, let, let me think. Um, one, I can't remember the name of the one guy. Um, oh, it escapes me for the moment. But anyway, this one Safari Club International, member yes. got his rocks off by um, having a private museum at home uh, and uh, he wanted only endangered species hanging on the wall. Now the, the obstacle he faced was the Endangered Species Act in America which prohibited the import of um, trophies for endangered species yes. but there was a loophole there was a loophole for museums registered uh, uh, officially recognized museums yes so so this guy started to make donations to the venerable smithsonian institute and uh, the Humane Society did an investigation and they found out that over a period of years, he had paid the Smithsonian over a hundred million dollars for no other purpose than to use them to import his endangered species trophies. Now that's one member yeah. of Safari Club International. Yeah. When you think that he's only one of hundreds, if not thousands, of equally wealthy uh, serial killers of animals, yeah. then you can see the size of the problem. Yes. Now, uh, I had another instance of the power uh, of Safari Club International. Yes. Um, oh, about 30 years ago or even more, uh, the new president of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta yes. banned all sport and trophy hunting on the basis that it was a barbaric relic of colonialism. Yes. So now, because there's been no sport hunting of lions, Kenya has a lot of mouth-watering trophy lions. <laughs> um, mouth-watering for those people. Yes. And they decided they wanted to kill some. So they organized a symposium, a wildlife symposium in Nairobi. Yeah. In order to persuade the existing government and the president uh, to lift the ban on trophy hunting of lions. Okay. And um, I got a call from the steering committee that was set up by the Kenyan government to fly to Nairobi and uh, to explain uh, to the people at the symposium exactly what this meant because yes. of course they were going to be fed propaganda yes and knowing how these people work the steering committee people said to me look you're too well known um they will probably uh, find a way to exclude you if we don't um put the topic of your talk uh, down as something harmless okay so they came up with the idea that i was going to fly up there and talk about the socio-economic impacts of hunting or something something bland like that yes so i flew up there and uh look this was not like south africa these guys are organized i mean at that symposium 
you had everybody. Uh, everybody who was remotely affected. For example, if there was going to be hunting, then that was going to affect tourism. So all the top people, the minister and the top people from tourism were there. They yes. were going to have to build roads. The people from the roads department and the minister were there. Yes. Um, there, there were hundreds of people there. So when it came to my turn, um, I knew I'd been advised by the steering committee that a lot of the uh, parliament, uh, Kenyan parliamentarians had been bribed uh, by uh, the uh, industry yes. in order to support uh, the lifting of the ban. Um, so um, when, I, when I got up to, to address, I bore in mind that this symposium was being funded not not by Safari Club International yeah. or by the hunting industry, yeah. by the American taxpayer. What? What? Yes, I know. My word. The, yeah. So you, you 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 had a symposium about the killing of animal one species of animals in a foreign country that was totally funded by U.S. aid. American foreign aid. That's incredible. That's how powerful uh, Safari Club International is. They can get the American government on their side. That's crazy. Anyway, um, unfortunately for them, uh, I had a lot of very damaging and upsetting footing, uh, foot, um, footage of um, canned hunts. Yeah. And of course, um, they had all the facilities for that. So I put on, while I was addressing them about the evils of canned hunting and asking them if this is how they wanted their lions to be treated. Yes. I had scenes of ghastly cruelty going on behind me on the big screen. And actually, it broke up. It, it caused such a stir. It actually broke up the meeting for a while. Mm. I was pushed and jostled and just wow. and accused of being, being a racist. But I mean, the roar uh, must have lifted the roof. Anyway, uh, it obviously had some impact because uh, the recommendation of, this, of the committee at the end to the president was that he maintains the ban on uh, lion trophy hunting. Yes. And that, as far as I know, is the position today. Yes. You can't go trophy hunting for lions in Kenya. Yes. That's an incredible story. Wow. What an achievement. I can't imagine their faces because, I mean, the images I've seen of canned lion hunting are hugely upsetting. Absolutely. And, of course, a video uh, footage tells a million <laughs> is better than a million words. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's incredible. Oh, well done, sir. Well done. Well, it wasn't so much myself. It was basically the power of the videos because they speak for themselves. They do. All I had to do was yes. just play the videos and then ask the meeting, is this how you want your lions treated? Yes. And that's when everything went haywire. Everyone yes. up shouting and screaming and, um, and, and the meeting broke up. Yeah. Chris, we are slowly but surely reaching the end of our time together on this particular topic. So I would like to say to you once more, as the founder of Campaign Against Can Hunting, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. You've shared some very valuable insight. And um, I'm hoping that we will have an opportunity to, to chat again and some more in the future. If you would like to learn more about the work being done by Chris and others mentioned in this podcast, please see the links in the description. Thanks for taking the time to listen. We hope you'll join us in our next conservation conversation. Just a quick shout out to the original music shop, also known as Tom's, for helping us set up our podcasting equipment with a stunning Rode podcaster microphone and boom arm. You guys are awesome. You guys are awesome. You guys are awesome.